Am I mute, still muted? No. Okay. So when I say hello, that's my subtle cue that I want to start talking now. Hello. <laughs> all right. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, this is my talk on uh, performance and scalability enhancements in PostgreSQL 9.2. Um, I told people that uh, I told people that uh, I really was uh, thinking of attending Alexander Korotkov's talk on regular expression searches this session. They told me they thought maybe I'd better come to this one. Uh, I was afraid I was going to be the only one here because I think that's probably going to be a pretty good talk. Uh, but I'm glad to uh, see you're all here. Um, so I just want to go uh, into a little bit more detail about some of the things uh, that, uh, that the PostgreSQL community, including me, but not limited to me, uh, were able to do in uh, Postgres 9.2 uh, to uh, improve performance uh, and scalability. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, by way of introduction, um, my name is Robert Haas. I'm a PostgreSQL major contributor and uh, PostgreSQL committer, um, and also a senior database architect at EnterpriseDB. Um, so we, uh, we improve performance in a lot of different areas uh, in PostgreSQL 9.2. Um, one of the areas, uh, and, and the one that makes the best graphs, um, is in the area of uh, uh, concurrency, high concurrency systems with many uh, CPUs all trying to do things at the same time. Um, but we had a, a variety of other uh, neat performance uh, improvements as well. Um, Index-only scans. Uh, are another uh, feature, which I'll talk a little bit more about as we go through. Um, Tom Lane did some great work on parameterized plans. Um, there has been uh, some work done by a couple different people, including Alexander Korkov, who's talking in the other room, on indexing. Um, uh, several people worked on sorting. Uh, that was kind of led by Peter Gagan, who's back there in the back. Um, he, he also uh, drove a lot of the work uh, on power consumption, along with Tom Lane, which I guess it's possibly arguable about whether uh, power consumption qualifies as a performance improvement, but I thought it was neat, so I threw it in. And a couple of miscellaneous things I'll mention briefly at the end. Since this is a little bit more of a hacker-oriented conference, I've also added a few slides to the end from the previous time I gave this uh, presentation, talking about some of the techniques that I found helpful uh, as I was working on performance for this release and kind of understanding uh, what the performance problems were and what areas needed improvement. So um, if, uh, well, for those of you in the audience who are, are PostgreSQL uh, developers or just uh, generally interested in benchmarking, uh, I've got a little bit at the end about some things that I've learned about uh, measurement over the course of uh, this release. So I'll talk about that at the end. Um, so this is a graph that I made back in September of last year. Um, and uh, this is essentially showing what happens when you uh, hit PostgreSQL with lots of really small queries. These are read-only queries. They're doing primary key lookups on a small table. So you have basically one table. It's not that big. Uh, and you're just trying to do uh, primary key lookups ups on it really, really fast. Um, these results were taken on a 32-core AMD Opteron 6128 box. Um, and what you can see is that in PostgreSQL 9.1, uh, the performance uh, tops out around 20 cores. Um, and after that, it, uh, it degrades a bit. And then around two clients, it, it levels off. This is a 32-core server. So what we would like to see, ideally, is performance go up on a straight diagonal line until it gets to 32 and then turn flat and stay flat across the rest of the graph. Because obviously, once we've used up all the CPUs uh, in the server, which we would hope to do with the minimum possible number of clients, we're not going to see any improvement after that. Um, and in fact, you can't really achieve that, because if you pile on a massive number of clients uh, that is far larger than the number of CPUs you have, inevitably, you're going to have some degradation. So you see that all of these lines slant down at varying rates as you go further out. In 9.1, it's a pretty gradual curve. Uh, this curve is very, uh, very uh, flat, actually. Um, it's not very high, but it's very predictable. You're going to be right about there. Um, so um, the first uh, patch that I committed to PostgreSQL 9.2 Devel uh, was actually the one that got 
the biggest bang for the buck in terms of uh, improving performance on this particular test. Um, and it got us from that blue line there up to the green line there. Um, and what, it, what essentially was happening there is that on this blue line, we were having lock contention while trying to figure out that we didn't have lock contention. So all of these different threads were trying to access the same table and the same index on that table at the same time. And so they all needed to lock the table, but not in a way that conflicted with each other. They all needed a lock that was strong enough to guarantee that, for example, nobody else could drop the table while they were in the middle of reading it. So they didn't need a real strong lock. They didn't need a lock that excluded other people trying to read data from the table. They just needed a lock that excluded a, a very uh, forceful operation like a, like a drop or an alter table or something like that. Um, so there was no actual locking conflict. There was no problem with all of these people proceeding at the same time, but they didn't know that. They spent a lot of time trying to verify that no lock conflict was present. So the fast locks patch um, <coughs> basically uh, made that common case where the table locks don't conflict. It made that case uncontended. And as you can see, um, you get a pretty significant performance boost out of that. Um, the, um, the red line came from some further improvements in that vein, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide. One of the things that I think is easy to miss on this slide is, you know, you look at the improvement here at 32 clients on this 32 core machine, and it's a factor of more than three. So it's a huge improvement. And you might say, well, that's great, but I don't have a 32 core server. But if you look down here, even in the vicinity of eight cores, e even though it gets kind of lost in the scale of the graph, that bump between the blue and the, and the red and the green is actually pretty significant. Um, so you are, you, are, you know, Jignesh gave a test, and he actually did some testing on an eight-core server that was similar to this. And, you know, you're not going to see multiples, but you're definitely going to see double-digit percentage improvement, even on a, you know, even on an eight-core box, which is not that big by, by today's standards anymore. Um, the other thing to notice is that one thing about that green line, that initial patch made the absolute value go a lot higher on this test, but you can also see that this green line is slanting down scary quickly as you add additional clients. This blue line's basically flat. The green line has a much deeper negative slope beyond 32 cores. And I, I didn't really pay much attention to that until somebody found a case where they actually made this green line drop down so fast that it went below the blue line. And I said, oh, I probably better see if I can figure out what's going on there and fix it. So we made a couple different improvements that, uh, that got past that. Um, so again, this is how we did it. Uh, the, the main part of it was that first bullet point, um, adding a fast pass to the lock manager to allow weak relation locks to bypass the main lock manager in most cases. Um, and then we extended that uh, to uh, allow uh, virtual transaction ID locks to also bypass the main lock manager. Um, and we, uh, we, uh, we did some optimization of something called shared and validation messages, which are only sent when some kind of DDL operation happens. And we were spending a lot of effort checking uh, whether there were any shared invalidation messages present, and the answer was almost always no, um, but we still spent a lot of energy checking on that. So we now uh, spend much less energy uh, checking for shared invalidation messages. Um, very small improvement if you've only one, got one client, but uh, when you have all this concurrency, it starts to matter. All right, did I say something about scaling out the 32 cores? So this graph uh, actually uh, is, was taken on a 64-core system, um, and you can see that, uh, uh, and it was done later, it was done in April. Um, I posted this on my blog uh, after I gave the first version of this talk, and uh, it, it became my most popular blog post ever, which I found kind of ironic since I'd written it in 10 minutes and hadn't even spell-checked the thing, uh, and really wasn't expecting any to be, anybody to be that impressed. Um, but it, it turned out to be people thought being able to scale out to 64 cores was pretty cool. Admittedly, this is a very simple test, um, but, uh, but it seems that if you've got the latest version of Postgres and the latest version of Linux and you've got everything set up right, you can get all the way up to 64 cores and do lots and lots of really small read-only queries very, very quickly. Um, one kind of interesting thing that you may have noticed on the other graph, and it's all, even more visible here, is you've got this kind of uh, dish shape here uh, between like 16 and 32 clients. And you'd really like that to be a diagonal line, right? I mean, you're looking for linear scalability. 
not scalability that starts out being less than linear and then it turns around and it's miraculously more than linear. Uh, you, you kind of feel nervous about that. I mean, it turns out that you know, the, the, the 64 core value here is something like 63.7 times the single core results. So in the end, at, at the limit, it's linear, but there's this place in the middle where it looks kind of not that linear. It's close-ish, but it's not there. Um, I mentioned this, uh, and Greg Smith uh, mentioned to me that he's seen this effect on tests that he's run as well. Um, and, and I subsequently, some other people showed me some uh, tests from a different operating system. Um, and I, I, I have reason to believe that this saddle shape here uh, in between 18 and 32 cores is actually a, an artifact of the way that the Linux scheduler does process scheduling, um, which I would like to prove. And I'd like to, and if it is that, I'd like to convince the Linux guys to see if they can do something about that. Um, but uh, hasn't happened yet. I'm sure. Um, so, uh, in addition to uh, in addition to optimizing for high uh, read concurrency, there were also some good optimizations uh, in this release for high write concurrency. Um, the uh, a colleague uh, at, at that time, anyway, of mine at, at Enterprise DB, a uh, guy named uh, Pavan, um, had this idea of uh, taking um, some of the uh, uh, members of a data structure called the PGProc data structure um, and moving them out of the main array and putting them in a separate array, which would be smaller. Um, and he said, well, you know, if you take this very heavily accessed data out of this big array and put it into a smaller array, uh, you'll see a performance improvement. And I said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my life. Uh, why? Are you wasting your time on that? Please pick a project that has some hope of success. It works great. <laughs> it's fantastic. So I guess that just underscores to me that it's a good idea to test these things. It turns out, I mean, it sort of makes sense. I was just amazed that the effect was actually large enough to be noticeable, but it's very noticeable. Um, it turns out that, uh, you know, uh, and I knew this, but I didn't appreciate the importance of it. CPUs move data around between the different CPUs in a multi-CPU system in chunks of like 64 bytes or 128 bytes or sometimes even 256 bytes. They're called cache lines. And the entire cache line is moved as a unit from one CPU to another CPU as the different CPUs access the data. So if you've got your really important data mixed into the same cache line with some unimportant data, you have to move around all that unimportant data along with the important data. And it turns out that if the ratio of important data to unimportant data is low enough, it costs you something material in terms of performance. This is obviously not going to be true for data structures that are hev less heavily tra trafficked than our PGProc data structure, which gets very, very hot. Um, but when you have something uh, that gets that hot, um, then, um, then uh, it does matter quite a bit. So uh, that, that was one of the biggest improvements uh, that we got. Um, and a lot of credit to Pavan for, for persisting uh, with that idea in the face of my um, stubborn insistence that it had no chance of working. Um, we also uh, did uh, some improvements, some various improvements. Uh, there were a bunch of different people who worked on this. Uh, I was one, uh, and there were a few others who I'll mention. Um, around. Um, around uh, C-log. C-log is a data structure that we use to keep track of which transactions are committed and which transactions are aborted and which transactions are still in progress. Um, so when a transaction commits, uh, we have to go to C-log and mark it committed. And when we need to know whether some transaction that we're interested in uh, committed or, or, or didn't, um, we also have to consult C-log for that information. Um, so. Uh, there were a series of optimization, and this, this turns out to be another one of our big contention points. So um, we, uh, Simon, uh, Simon Riggs had a, a patch that he uh, had been uh, cooking up, and I posted some benchmark results uh, showing that there was an issue in this area. And he said, oh, I have a patch, which fixes that problem. And sure enough, it did. Um, so we, uh, that's the first bullet point in that second section there. We improved the responsiveness of a process called the wall writer um, so that we get um, 
uh, commit records for asynchronously committed transactions on disk more quickly than we did before. And it turns out that if you're using asynchronous commits, that can actually improve performance significantly. Um, we also increased the number of C log buffers. Um, uh, we previously had a, a, a hard-coded uh, limit of 64K of memory for caching that. Um, now it's, uh, it's uh, an adaptive algorithm, but it caps at four times that value. Uh, so there's more memory available for this cache, which does help. Um, we fixed uh, what I would consider to be pretty much a bug in the SLRU buffer replacement algorithm, which could cause the whole system to grind to a halt with everybody waiting on an I.O. to complete when that I.O. was basically irrelevant to what anyone was actually trying to do. Um, so we fixed a bug in that algorithm. Uh, we eliminated some redundant C log lookups during index scans. Um, Simon and Peter and Heike uh, all worked on uh, improving the piggybacking of, uh, of wall flush, which results in better uh, group commit behavior. There was a talk on that earlier today, so I won't uh, belabor the point uh, too much. Um, but that was a very, uh, a very significant improvement uh, for certain cases. Um, and uh, we also uh, had an optimization to reduce the volume of uh, write-ahead log information generated when you copy data into a table, um, which was done by uh, my colleague Heike. So this, does it, this graph here doesn't uh, reflect uh, all of those things, those optimizations. Uh, the results were done in February. This has got the main optimizations in it. It doesn't show the benefit of the group commit because this uh, was done with asynchronous commit. Um, but you can see, mostly because I have a slow disk subsystem on the machine I was using to benchmark this, and I don't have a flashback write cache or anything like that. Um, but you can see that, uh, that the throughput of the system is not linear, um, but it is better. Um, so you can see that between 9.1 and, and this uh, oh, in, in, process, in process version of 9.2 that I tested, um, you know, at, at 24 clients or 32 clients, you have, you know, something close to a, a 50% uh, improvement on this. This is just a straight PG bench test, uh, median of 330 minutes runs to kind of average out the noise. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, clearly we still have a way to, to go, ways to go uh, before we really get this to scale linearly um, all the way out to as many CPUs as you can afford to buy. Uh, but we're getting there. I think we made some good progress in this release, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue to uh, nibble away at it. And uh, an extra few thousand transactions per second is pretty nice. Um, this graph is uh, commit scalability. So this is showing the effect of the work on, uh, that was done on group commits. Um, I had a little trouble re replicating this with uh, stock PG Bench. Um, so this is uh, a test that uh, Peter pointed me at. It basically just does a single insert in a transaction by itself. Um, so it's the maximally commit bound workload uh, that you can come up with. Um, so you are unlikely to see this much benefit in a real world use case. But on the other hand, this really does show you how much better uh, the new implementation is than the old implementation. Um, this green line, again, is, is 9.1. And uh, this red line is PG 9.2 as of March. And I don't think much has changed. Uh, in this picture since then. So you can see that uh, you know, down with, uh, with smaller numbers of clients, things are mushed together here at the bottom end of the graph. Uh, there's not a huge benefit, but as you start to ramp up the number of clients, and particularly as you start to get up to like 250 clients, was kind of the sweet spot on this particular machine, which is a uh, 16 physical cores, 64 hardware threads, uh, out at around 250 clients. I mean, you just have a massive improvement in performance, something, you know, something on the order of a factor of six or eight times uh, faster than, uh, than it was in 9.1. Um, so that's definitely, uh, that's definitely pretty cool. Um, let me ask if there's just any questions on anything that I've gotten over so far before I sort of plunge into the next section. Questions? OK. Either that was very clear or everyone's asleep. OK, um, index-only scans, uh, another uh, major performance feature uh, in 9.2. Um, since 8.4, we've had this data structure called uh, the visibility map. Um, and uh, basically, what it does is it stores one bit 
uh, for every 8K table page. Um, so it's very, very small. Uh, an 8K page of visibility map covers half a gigabyte of, of table space. Um, and the visibility map bit is set uh, only if we know that every tuple on that page uh, is visible to all current and future transactions, at, at least until somebody modifies the page. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the reason why we didn't have index-only scans in earlier releases, even though we had this, um, is because the visibility map uh, was not crash safe. Um, and it actually, as I, as I recently discovered, it also just had some plain old race conditions. So it was possible to have the, for the visibility map to have errors. Um, and in those older releases, we only use the visibility map as a way of accelerating vacuum, uh, which it does very well. So if you're on a release prior to 8.4, uh, I would definitely recommend that you upgrade unless you hear the word vacuum and you're like, oh yeah, I never have a problem with that. Um, but, uh, but in 9.2, uh, we have hopefully flushed out all of the, uh, 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 the bugs that made the visibility map potentially inaccurate. And that means that we can use it uh, not only for vacuuming, which, uh, where it's not a disaster if we occasionally fail to vacuum something that we should have vacuumed, or, or even less of a problem if we occasionally vacuum something that we didn't really need to. Um, it means we can actually use this for answering queries where we really need to be sure that we are going to only give people right answers all the time. Um, and uh, so the idea is pretty simple. Uh, if all the data we need to answer the user's query is available from the index tuple, then instead of reading the table page, we just probe the visibility map. And if we find that the page is all visible, um, then we don't actually need to read the table page. Uh, we can just return the, the data directly from the index tuple because we know that that, uh, that, that uh, tuple is going to be visible to our scan. Uh, but if we find that the page isn't all visible, then we have to go check. Because it could be that that tuple was inserted by a transaction that aborted, uh, or it's recently been deleted, or it's recently been inserted, and it might not be visible to our MPC snapshot. Um, so this is optimizing for a pretty common case where you have a table that's fairly static. right? If you have a table that's very, very heavily updated all the time, um, you're not going to get much benefit from index-only scans. Uh, on the other hand, you, you, may have <laughs> you may have much worse performance problems in other areas. So uh, we'll see how this works out. I think you know, this version of index-only scans, um, I think it's definitely a big step forward over uh, what we've had in the past. I also expect it to need fine-tuning over the next couple of releases before we really get it to do all of the things. Uh, that we'd like it to do. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is a test case that I whipped up on my trusty MacBook Pro here, a high performance machine, I assure you. Uh, um, it's got four gigabytes of RAM. I usually set shared buffers to 400 megabytes, mostly because it ends in two zeros and I like round numbers. Um, I uh, initialized a uh, grossly oversized PG Bench instance. Uh, uh, scale factor 1000, um, which is uh, far too large to test with comfortably uh, on a machine with only four gigabytes of RAM. Um, and uh, I ran a, uh, a five-minute uh, I ran a five-minute select-only test with uh, eight uh, concurrent workers, um, and it's just banging it with uh, read-only primary key lookups using the primary key index on the table. Um, then I created a, a covering index. I created a second index on the table alongside the primary key index that includes not only the column that is being used to look up the value, but also the column that's being returned. So this query is select a balance from PG Bench accounts where AID equals some value. So I put both AID, which is what we're using for the lookup, and a balance into this second index. Um, and interestingly, I found out that the two indexes were exactly the same size. The single column index and the two column index were the same size down to the byte. They were each 2,142 megabytes, uh, which uh, conveniently enough is smaller than RAM, uh, whereas the size of the whole data set is larger than RAM. So the idea here is here is I'm setting up a test case where hopefully by only needing to access the indexes, um, I'm able to fit the entire test case in memory Whereas if I had to access the table, I would have to go to disk, and things would presumably be much slower. So what happened? Well, it was about five times faster. 
Um, with the default PG Bench configuration, I got 63 transactions a second. Uh, with the covering index, I got 302 transactions per second. Um, now, the thing about index-only scans uh, is that I've seen widely varying test results with this, ranging from people who said, this hardly helped me at all, to one case where uh, Tom Brown said, yeah, my test case was 700 times faster. Um, I think he had a test case where the index fit in shared buffers, and the table didn't even fit in RAM. Um, so, you know, the, the, as with many of these performance improvements, you know, some people are going to see massive gains, other people are going to see no gains at all. You might even be one of the really lucky people who hit some kind of regression, and it's actually slower. Um, but, uh, but hopefully not. Bruce? Yeah, that's true. Uh, moving, and so it fit all on cash line, and then we got this index scan thing where we're doing the same kind of thing. I don't know if there's another, like, you know, line sitting in there somewhere, but it, it's, just, it's just kind of interesting. It's a pattern I did not do. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, you'll see widely varying indexes, it, widely varying results in this, depending on exactly how you test. Um, you know, my traditional advice to people when I give my query planner talk is indexes are slower than you think they are, and I think that, uh, I think that advice probably still applies. Um, but now we at least have the potential for somebody to make a covering index and have that help, which had zero chance of working in any previous release. So that's kind of cool. Yeah? Yes. No, because uh, I made Bruce uh, <laughs> modify PG upgrade so that when you PG upgrade to 9.2, it nukes your visibility map, which may not be great in terms of the fact that you'll have to do a full table vacuum up all of those, but it seems better than your queries will start returning wrong answers. <laughs> awesome. Yes, index-only scans are shown in the explain plan. And explain analyze will also tell you the number of times that we had to fetch a tuple from the heap in the process of doing the scan. So you can actually tell, A, whether you're doing an index-only scan, and B, whether it's managing to actually be index-only, or whether it's having to go and check the heap anyway because the pages have been recently modified and you haven't vacuumed yet. One of the big weaknesses here is that auto vacuum doesn't know that vacuuming to makes index only scans work better. So it, auto vacuum is only going to vacuum your table because it knows that getting rid of dead tuples is important. It's not going to vacuum your table because it knows that setting visibility map bits uh, to make this optimization work, work better is also important. So if you're relying on index only scans, I'm a little concerned that we may find that people say, oh, I've got to schedule ma manual vacuums in order to get the benefit out of this. Uh, where that hasn't been necessary uh, for a few releases because of improvements in auto vacuum. Um, unfortunately, uh, nobody had enough round two its to address that for this. Release. Yeah? In the previous slide, you told us something about index Yep. Yeah, so it turned out that the index on just AID was the same size as the index on AID and A balance. I believe that just means that there was padding space in the single column index that got eaten up by that second column. So we didn't actually really, we were just wasting, we were wasting some padding space when the single column index and. One of the cases here, the alignment allowed it to be changed, but in some other cases, it might be that the index size will be different when we add. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think one of the other things that's going to cause this to not work for some people. Uh, is the fact that adding more columns to the index makes them bigger. And this is a, a bit a huge pitfall of every uh, 
Postgres release in memory is that you know if you make your index bigger than your table in the worst case, uh, then you know scanning the index doesn't necessarily save you that much uh, over just reading the data out of the table. So I think you know I, I have big hopes for this feature, but you know I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't expect that this is just magic go faster sauce uh, <laughs> where you just like you know. You just like pour it out, and, and your database is like lightning speed. I think it's going to be a good tool for people who have the right workload, which means mostly read only, um, and a data set that it's bigger than RAM. And there's more and more people who have data sets that fit in RAM because uh, data sets keep ba getting bigger, but there's still a lot of people who can fit their data in a terabyte of RAM. And you can buy that now, it's not cheap. But you can buy it. There's even a lot of people who can fit it into 128 gigabytes of RAM, which even more people can afford to buy. Um, so there are, there are, you know, there's definite. This is definitely not the be-all and the end-all. It's nice, but um, it's only going to apply in certain situations, um, and you're going to have to, uh, especially in this first release where it's still a little rough around the edges. Uh, you're probably going to have to fiddle with it a little to figure out whether you can get a benefit and how big it's going to be. Yeah. Well, so the index blocks that the index only scan needs to look at, yes, those are stored in shared buffers, just as they would be for a regular index scan. So is the 20% allocation of your RAM of shared buffers still applicable for that? Um, no, 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 no. That, the ones that get right in end up, we're not so, in there. So the question of how to set shared buffers um, is a really good one that I don't have time to tell you about it now, right now, but I do have a long blog post on how to set shared buffers and wall, on wall buffers. Um, so go to rhouse.blogspot.com and look at my post on this topic. And it's got everything that I know. And if you know something that I don't, then please let me know, because I'd love to know more than I do. Yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you think that there are some limitations in the index only scan that you did Yes. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, if index is there, so it will go, try to go to index on this scan. Well, so just like every other, just just so, so there's an index scan, and there's a sequential scan, and there's a bitmap index scan, and now we have this new fourth way, which is called an index only scan, and we just estimate the cost of each technique, and we pick the one that we think is going to be cheapest. So our existing costing model for index scans guesses how many index pages we're going to have to read and how many heap pages we're going to have to read. And it uses that with the costing variables to estimate the cost. This is the same thing, except that the number of heap pages that we think we're going to have to read is going to be smaller, because we, we have a new piece of information in uh, PG class, which tells us what fraction of the blocks we think are all visible. And we use that to estimate how many heap patches we're going to get to skip. Or index totally not only scans. See, the thing about this is you're absolutely right. And the only thing I can really say in defense of the name is there's other products out there. And they all have this exact same problem. And they still call it index only scans. So it really should be called hopefully index only scans. <laughs> because if it turns out not to be index only, it's going to be worse. right? Like if it turns out that we have to fetch all of the heap tuples, and we also wasted this energy checking the visibility map, which says, oh, you have to do the regular thing anyway, it's going to be slower. You can't do more work and have it be faster. Um, so uh, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think this is where, uh, as we get some experience with this technology, we'll be able, better able to adjust the costing model to figure out which cases this is going to, be, this is going to win and where it's going to lose, and hopefully patch up some of the cases that lose right now and make them win later. Um, but it's just a complicated enough feature that to think we were going to get it perfect the first time through would require more smarts than any of us have. So. Uh, it depends on what the problem is. So 
So again, I don't want to get into tuning questions in this talk. Uh, the question is about tuning statistics targets. Um, I have a query planner talk where I talk about that kind of stuff, but that's not this talk. So I'd be happy to talk, catch up with you afterwards. But I'm afraid if I don't move on, we won't get through the rest of the slides. And since I made the slides, I like think they're good, and I want to like have time to tell you what they say. So uh, if it's okay with everybody, let's uh, defer any more index-only scan questions to the end. And I'm going to talk about some other stuff, which you may think is totally boring, and maybe you're right. But hey, I made the slides, so uh, let's go. Oh, uh, wrong direction. Wait, what's happening? OK. So. Um, Tom Lay did some work on a feature called parameterized plans. And by did some work, I actually mean he did all of it. Um, a lot of stuff I worked on this release, I had help with a couple of other people from a couple of other people. Tom basically just cranked this one out. Um, and again, like some of the other things we've talked about, it's only going to benefit you in a limited set of cases. But if you hit one of those cases, you're going to be really happy. <laughs> um, so this is the same MacBook Pro as before, uh, same PG Bench minus I minus S1000. Um, and I came up with a pretty artificial test query here. Um, I joined, I did a left join between generate series um, and uh, two copies of the PG Bench accounts table. Um, so what this is really intended to represent is a left join between a small table, which in this case is generate series, so it's a 10 row set returning function. Um, and two large tables that are joined to each other. In this case, it happens to be the same large table joined to itself for the sole purpose of making the query planner have to think harder. Um, but in general, it could be any two large tables joined to each other. The important part is that you've got an inner join under the nullable side of a left join. Okay. If you don't know what that means, you probably don't have this case. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so if you have a left join, and then on the nullable side of it, which means the, 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 far, the side that's farther down in the query in this case, you've got another join happening inside there. Maybe you have this because you have a view that does something like this. Um, or maybe you just have a big complicated query. Um, then uh, in earlier releases of Postgres, the only way that we could execute this query, join the two big tables to each other, and then do the join to the small table after we joined the big tables. And that turns out to be slow, because joining big tables to each other so that you can pull out a very small fraction of them is not efficient. Um, so Tom uh, rejiggered some things so that now what we can do is instead of doing the join between the two big tables once and joining the entirety of the two tables to each other, we repeatedly joined very small subsets uh, of the big tables to each other and pull out just the information that we need. Um, and so on this, uh, you know, this somewhat artificial test case, but I think it actually is representative of the kind of, impro of uh, improvement you'll see when this kicks in in real world situations. On 9.1, uh, this takes, repeatedly takes uh, about 4 minutes and 10 seconds to execute on my laptop. On PG 9.2, the first execution took 580 milliseconds. And then after that, it took about one. So it was a little faster. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you, if you have these kinds of queries where you're hurting because you don't have this optimization, this is huge. The reason why we haven't had this optimization sooner, of course, is because a lot of people don't have these kinds of queries. So that's why this is the case that got fixed last, right? Not a big surprise there. But Boy, if you have it, this is huge. Um, so here's the plan in 9.1. Um, we basically do a full index scan of both tables, do a merge join between them, and then do a merge join to generate series. Meh, not very good. Um, in 9.2, um, we scan the output of the set returning functions. And then that drives this nested loop here, where we repeatedly index scan each of the relations. So in the first plan, we end up reading the entirety the big table twice, or the entirety of both big tables, if we two separate big tables. In the 9.2 plan, we just pull out the rows that we need surgically and just ignore all of the rest of that data. So it, it's a lot faster. Um, we've had some miscellaneous improvements uh, in indexing. Um, 
One of them, which I've actually seen come up in the field, is if you have an expression of the form some index column operator usually equals any array blah blah blah. Uh, we could not previously handle that with a plain index scan. A bitmap index you could get a bitmap index scan for that plan, but not a plain index scan. Um, and it turned out that there were cases where that sucked. Um, so uh, Tom fixed that. Now you can get a plain index scan. Um, we've got better selectivity estimation now for some of the array operators. Overlaps uh, contained is contained by. Um, we've had a number of improvements to GIST indexing. Um, GIST indexes now build more quickly than they did before, and they're of better quality. B tree indexes don't really have a problem with quality. I mean, when you make a B tree index, you basically just take all your data and put it in sorted order, and that's it. But GIST indexes are used for things like spatial indexing, where the way that you index your data is you try to group it together and put bounding boxes around points that are in the same region of space and put all those data elements on one page. So that's, kind of, that's the kind of thing that humans are good at and computers kind of suck at um, because it's hard, right? I mean, if you have a random set of points and you have no knowledge about how they're distributed and you have to figure out the most efficient way to group them into related areas, um, and especially if you have things that are more than a single point, like you have circles or lines or polygons or something, and you have to figure out a set of reasonably tight bounding boxes that are going to allow you to answer qu queries efficiently, that turns out to be kind of hard to do. So we've had some improvements uh, in the algorithm that not only decrease the index build time, but also tend to result in a better quality of index where you have to do less graveling around in the index to determine whether or not your key that you're searching for is actually present and, and what pages it might be on. Um, so that's definitely cool. Um, and we have a new uh, index type as well called SPGIST. Um, that's pretty much everything I know about it. Um, it I know slightly more about it than that, but not much. SPGIST, uh, just in general, can index anything. I mean, if you can imagine it and you can think about how to index it, you can index it with GIST. Um, SP just is a more specialized thing for indexing uh, things that sort of occupy a particular point in space. So like you can use just to index lines or polygons or circles or points. SP just you can index points because a point doesn't have any dimensionality to it. Um, it can also be used for some uh, text searching applications. Um, I have not yet been able to demonstrate a performance improvement in the text searching case over uh, a P tree. Um, so I think maybe there's more work to be done there, or maybe that's just not really what this is intended for. Um, I've heard that if you have the right cases, uh, this is pretty cool, but fortunately, I don't know what they are. Yeah. The very first one on the slide. Um, I think it doesn't really matter whether the index is multi-column or single column. It just matters whether you have a construct of that form. Okay. Um, we could talk more about what your specific case that you're worried about is afterwards, maybe. Uh, sorting. This, uh, this work was really... Uh, uh, something that uh, nobody was, well, not, not nobody, many people were not that excited about, and Peter kept beating on us and saying, this is a disgrace, our sorting is too slow, speed it up. So he got it done um, uh, with some help from some other people, uh, as is often the case. Um, but we have this new infrastructure uh, called uh, sort support, um, and it's basically a fat trimming exercise. Um, we have some very nice, very general mechanisms. Um, and actually, another theme of performance in this release is sometimes you need to throw your general mechanisms out the window and install some very specific hacks to alleviate problems in your hotspots. Um, and so that's basically what got done with sorting this release, uh, with, with Peter kind of leading the charge on that uh, and, and really insisting that this was a problem we needed to care about. Um, so 
uh, we've seen some some uh, some improvements um, in uh, in sorting speed in this release. Um, I was lazy and I don't have a benchmark. Sorry, um, but uh, we, do, we did have some improvements. Um, Peter was also the driving force behind uh, getting our power consumption down, um, and he did a lot of the work on this. Uh, Tom Lane also did some work on this. Um, in PostgreSQL 9.1, there are approximately 11.5 auxiliary process wake-ups per second, uh, whereas as of a snapshot last night, uh, I had to retest this from the last time I did this talk because it changed. Uh, but as of last night, there are approximately 0 0.4 auxiliary process wake-ups per second on a system that's been idle for a few minutes. Now, if you're looking at this and uh, going, why should I care? Uh, that was my reaction, too. Uh, but it turns out that if you are a big hosting provider and you have a lot of virtual machines floating around and you have a lot of virtualized copies of Postgres floating around and they're all randomly eating CPU for no reason, even though the users aren't doing anything, it costs you money. And you don't like that because you're probably a business and not just virtualizing things because you're generous. So um, this, is, this is pretty cool. I think um, you know, there are an increasing number of people out there uh, Heroku is one example, uh, and, and there are others who are just running, you know, gazillions of copies of Postgres. And so having the system be able to quiesce down into a very low power state, um, you know, uh, when, when it's not in use uh, is a very good thing. Um, you know, it's something like, I mean, it's an improvement of more than 20x. Um, I was testing this uh, last night on a virtual machine on my laptop. That's where that 0.4 number comes from. Um, and you know, uh, now VMware Tools is actually the top, uh, the top producer of wake-ups on that machine when it's otherwise idle, about 10 wake-ups per second. Uh, but there's not that many things above Postgres, so I can guess that at some point five years from now, people are going to say, you have 0.4 wake-ups per second. That's completely unacceptable. You can't have more than 0.004 wake-ups per second. But you know, for now, we're way off of the bucket list of the people who are upset about uh, these kinds of problems, or people like Red Hat and Heroku and um, other, other people who are running a lot of copies of Postgres. So um, there's a bunch of other random performance improvements, as there are in almost every release. Um, we, uh, we have uh, uh, an improved plan cache now that reduces the danger of getting a bad query plan. Uh, when using prepared queries. More work is probably still needed there, um, uh, but, uh, but uh, we've made a start on it in this release. Uh, it's been a long time thorn in the side of many Postgres users. Um, SEP GSQL, which is a PostgreSQL SE Linux integration, now has a user space access vector cache, uh, which makes it only really slow instead of far more slow than you can possibly believe. Uh, there's probably some more room for optimization there, but uh, it's definitely better. Um, hey, any price for security? Um, f we have got uh, faster array assignment now in PLPGSQL due to some improved caching. Um, our spin lock uh, implementation on HP Itanium did not conform to the best practices document published by HP. Now it does. Um, and that's about all I could think of in terms of performance improvements in 9.2. Um, I'd like to just take uh, the last few minutes to talk over some things that I learned while working on uh, some of these performance improvements, testing other people's performance improvements, testing theories about what would or would not improve performance. Uh, I learned a lot uh, from this release. I learned a lot from other people in the PostgreSQL community, uh, Peter, Simon, Greg, uh, Tom, uh, lots of people who kind of turned, Jignesh, uh, people who kind of turned me on to things that I should be looking at. And I also learned a lot uh, just by doing a lot of benchmarking and staring at the results and going, oh, why is it like that? Um, so here are some of the things I learned. You may or may not find them interesting, but here we go. Um, first lesson, uh, plain old PG Bench is a pretty good test. Um, in, some, in some cases, it's a very artificial test, um, but sometimes artificial tests are good because they take some particular aspect of the platform and just stretch it to the limit. Um, you can get a, a pretty good sense of how fast your machine is on a select-only PG Bench test in about five minutes, um, but you really need to do like 30-minute runs 
uh, if you're doing a write test, because there's a lot more throughput variability on a write test than there is uh, on a read test. Um, I found that it was pretty important to repeat every test about three times um, uh, so that you could identify outliers, um, because sometimes you get a result which is randomly higher or lower than the, the normal result for that test. Um, I found that, uh, that, that on the read-only tests, there was very little uh, variation throughout the test and the rate at which transactions were being processed. It basically just sits there and hums along. Uh, on write-only tests, the throughput as a function of time during the test shoots up and down by uh, a huge amount. Um, you can use the PG bench minus L option to record the latency associated with processing every transaction that the system processes during the test. And I found that quite helpful because you can then construct a graph that shows the number of transactions per second on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, and you can actually see the throughput rate going up and down throughout the test. But there's a couple problems with that. One is you have to write a script to grovel through these enormous files that PG Bench minus L spits out. The other is that the files are so darn big that it actually lowers the performance of the system significantly from writing all of this instrumentation data. So there's probably some room for improvement there. Um, there's a source level option called LW lock stats. Uh, if you turn it on, uh, it dumps out all of this information showing you uh, information about LW lock acquisitions and contention. Uh, I found that very helpful. I also found it uh, even better uh, if I counted how many times I had to uh, spin to acquire the spin lock protecting each lightweight lock. Um, for those in the audience who are not hackers, lightweight locks uh, are a, a sort of fixed size set of locks that we use to protect shared memory data structures uh, in Postgres. Uh, they have a shared mode and an exclusive mode, and, they're protect and their internal state is protected by a spin lock. Um, if you need to wait for a lock, you sleep using a semaphore. Um, so lightweight locks are actually where most of our contention problems are, and unfortunately don't have a good set of user visible tools uh, to really let you know where this contention is happening, but uh, the LW lock stats thing you can turn on for debugging purposes to kind of help track it down. Whoops, um, slide. Um, I found that CPU profiling via GProf or OProfile is useless because they have too much overhead. OProfile has a lot less than GProf and it's still way too much. Perf, on the other hand, is a new Linux tool and it is awesome. It has very low overhead, almost no overhead. Um, which is amazing. I have no idea how it's possible to gather call graph information on a 64-core system running full tilt uh, without slowing the system down, but apparently somebody else is smarter than me because it works. Um, perf, uh, the, the, the big problem with just plain old perf record is that it's not a really great way to measure scalability because typically when Postgres isn't scaling well, it's because you've got log contention and threads are going to sleep asleep, they're not using CPU time, so a CPU profile looks exactly the same as it would if you didn't have a problem. Um, so you can't really find anything that way. Um, context switch profiling is better. If you do perf record minus ECS minus G, you can actually see which call paths are causing the system to go to sleep, and that tells you where your lock contention is. I'm not sure how useful this is as a user, but uh, as a, a PostgreSQL developer looking for things to optimize, that was uh, pretty great. Um, I also wrote a bunch of throwaway custom instrumentation, uh, which was awesome. Just take a random piece of the code. You're wondering, why is this code slow? You just stick a bunch of get time of day calls in there uh, and subtract, and you're like, oh, it's all in that chunk. And then you drill down another level and rinse and repeat. Um, uh, another, some more general lessons I learned, apart from specific kinds of testing. Extreme workloads like PG Bench. Uh, are not necessarily a great thing to do as a way of, you know, uh, answering the question, how will this perform on my real-world workload? Because it's an artificial, extreme workload in some particular way. Not necessarily the most demanding workload, although P write, write only PG write, writing PG bench test is pretty extreme in terms of I.O., um, often the results will be worse than what you're really going to, much worse in some cases than what you're going to see on a real world application. But again, for developing, it's great because it exacerbates the problems that real users say and turns them into even larger problems, which, are, which can be seen more clearly and therefore fixed. Um, a lot of problems are 
quite easy to fix. Not all, but many problems are quite easy to fix once you understand what's really happening. But there are a number of cases where it took me months and months of testing and fiddling with different things and trying different approaches before I actually understood what the real problem was. In fact, in at least one notable case, I committed a fix to fix the problem. And it turned out that problem was imaginary, and the fix was working for a largely unrelated reason that I figured out three months later when I fixed the real problem. Um, so uh, you know, figuring it out is often the, the hard part. It's very useful to measure system performance along multiple axes, not just TPS, although that's useful, but also latency, frequency of lock contention, duration of lock stalls. You find different problems when you look at system performance in different ways. And, you know, it's sort of, it's sometimes hard to tell, should I look at the most important problem from the TPS perspective, or should I look at things that are causing the lock stalls? It's not always easy to decide what to work on, but the more data you can gather, the better off you are. Another kind of interesting developer level thought is that these LW locks we have, I'm starting to have a feeling that they're actually very poorly suited to many of the synchronization tasks that we need to do inside of PostgreSQL. I don't yet really have a theory on what would be a good replacement for them. So what's next? Um, well, buffer replacement is still mostly single threaded. Um, I don't have time to talk about this because I'm like out of time. Um, but there's a graph on my blog uh, in one of the older posts that actually shows it pretty clearly. You get much better scalability if your workload fits in shared buffers. Scalability deteriorates significantly when your workload does not fit in shared buffers. Um, while insertion is single threaded, this gets particularly nasty just after a checkpoint. I'm thinking this is something that's going to get fixed in 9.3 since Hakey's been cooking on a patch. Um, on a busy system, F-Sync can take an amazingly long time to complete, like 10 seconds sometimes, to F-Sync a really small file. So uh, every place in the, in the system uh, where we do F-Syncs is a potential uh, cause of performance problems. Uh, and I hope to spend some more time trying to flush those out. Um, and a final uh, point, we have this lock, PROC array lock, which is used during snap MVCC snapshot acquisition. It's also taken during transaction commit. Uh, the more other bottlenecks we fix, the worse this one looks. Um, I think if Heike gets the wall insert lock, uh, problem fixed. This is going to move so far ahead of everything else in terms of how bad it is that we can just give up on doing any other performance work and we've figured out a solution to this problem. Uh, so that's all I've got. I'm out of time, so I'm not going to ask for questions in the big group here because that's not fair to people who want to go to the bathroom before the next talk. But I'll uh, hang around up here, and if people want to come up or ask questions or catch me in the hallway, I'd uh, love to talk to you. Thanks.